When the Europeans arrived in the Western Hemisphere, these invaders behaved, by and large, as conquerors have behaved all over the world for thousands of years, which is to say, brutally, greedily, and with arrogance toward the conquered peoples. Indeed, that is very much the way that Indian conquerors behaved toward other Indians, long before Columbus's ships first appeared on the horizon. However, Europeans' discovery of the Western Hemisphere was not only a watershed in the history of the indigenous peoples of the New World, it was one of the most momentous events in the history of the human race. For this discovery meant that each half of the planet now became aware of the other half's existence, and began a massive interchange of material things and cultures, as well as a massive movement of people across the Atlantic. Nothing would ever be the same again, in either half of the world. Foods never seen before would become crucial to the diets of people thousands of miles away, the potato in Ireland, for example, and commercial crops never grown before, such as rubber in Malaya and cocoa in Nigeria, would become mainstays of national economies. Sweet potatoes would become a defense against famine in China, which ended up producing more of this Western Hemisphere vegetable than the rest of the world put together. Transfers in the other direction were also of major and transforming importance. In a hemisphere that had never seen horses before, many Indians on the American plains would become skilled horsemen, hunting and fighting mounted and using firearms. For the first time in history, millions of people would migrate across an ocean, by choice from Europe and by force from Africa, and whole new disease environments would intermingle, with devastating impact on the native peoples of North and South America. The introduction of liquor was likewise devastating and even longer lasting in its effects than the new diseases, to which the surviving remnants of the original Indian population eventually acquired biological resistance. While the disease transfer was not all one way, an epidemic of syphilis broke out in Europe after the return of Columbus's ships from the Western Hemisphere, still the Europeans were not nearly as affected by the diseases of the Indians as the latter were by the diseases from Europe. In the tropical regions of the New World, however, both the Europeans and the Indians proved to be vulnerable to yellow fever from Africa. In one way or another, and to varying degrees from place to place, American Indians would be incorporated over the centuries into a very different set of cultures from Europe. Both the natural and the man-made catastrophes they suffered undermined faith in their existing traditions and leaders, who were largely unable to ward off these new catastrophes. After a smallpox epidemic in the early 18th century killed nearly half the Cherokees, medicine men were repudiated, and the Cherokees began to regard European doctors as more knowledgeable. Earlier Indian survivors of a devastating epidemic in the vicinity of the European settlement at Roanoke interpreted their plight religiously, as evidence that the god of the Europeans was more powerful than the Indian gods. In short, the indigenous population of the hemisphere was deprived not only of land and freedom, they were, to varying degrees, deprived also of the underlying foundation of cultural traditions on which any society is based. In parts of the Western Hemisphere, they would be largely absorbed biologically as well. In the United States, very few American Indians were of unmixed ancestry by the late twentieth century, and in much of Hispanic America, mestizos generally outnumbered pure-blooded Indians, and in some places outnumbered people of pure-blooded European ancestry as well. Since most of the peoples of the Western Hemisphere lacked any system of writing before the Europeans came, their pre-Columbian history, like the history of early Anglo-Saxon England and the early history of the Slavs, Sub-Saharan Africans, and other non-literate peoples around the world, can only be sketchily pieced together from archaeological and other clues. The very population of the hemisphere before the first white men arrived remains a matter of conjecture and controversy. One scholar estimated the pre-Columbian population of the hemisphere as low as 8.4 million, while another estimate put it at from 90 million to 112 million. What is clearer is that the population density varied, being greater in South America than in North America, greater along the coasts than in the interior, and greater on the Pacific coast than on the Atlantic coast. As in other parts of the world, population densities tended to be greatest where there was more highly developed agriculture, as in the Aztec and Inca empires, and sparsest where hunting and gathering societies predominated. 
Hunter-gatherers in what is today Mexico were looked down upon as barbarians by the more sophisticated Indian civilizations of the region, as more advanced societies have disdained, conquered, enslaved, or exterminated hunter-gatherers in other parts of the world. The indigenous population of the Western Hemisphere declined catastrophically after the diseases of Europe struck peoples with little or no biological resistance to these diseases. By the end of the 19th century, the Indian population of the United States was between a third and a fourth of what it is estimated to have been when the first white men arrived. The devastation was even worse in other parts of the Western Hemisphere. Despite differing estimates today of the absolute size of the population of Mexico when the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century, there is broad agreement on the drastic shrinkage of that population in the century after 1520 a decline from 22 million Indians to just 2 million. The indigenous population of Peru likewise declined by approximately 90% after the Spanish conquest there. The 20th century American Indian population of Brazil was less than 5% of its estimated level when Europeans arrived. In the Caribbean, the indigenous population was virtually annihilated. The horrendous impact of new diseases may have had at least as much to do with the Indians losing control of the hemisphere to Europeans as the military encounters between the two, in which the technological advantage generally lay with the invaders. While it has not been uncommon in history for a smaller military force from a more developed society to prevail over a numerically superior force from a society less technologically or organizationally advanced, the Roman invaders of Britain, or the European invaders of Africa, for example. Nevertheless, the numerical disparity in the Western Hemisphere was extreme. Whether the lowest or the highest estimate of the population of the Western Hemisphere in pre-Columbian times is closer to the facts, there were still millions of Indians, and probably tens of millions. Yet the entire European population of the Western Hemisphere had not yet reached one million as late as the middle of the 17th century, more than 150 years after Columbus arrived. By that time, the Spaniards alone had established an empire that stretched from San Francisco Bay to the River Platte in Argentina. Comparisons of the size of the Indian and European populations as of the early generations after Columbus can be misleading, however insofar as such comparisons suggest that there was a simple race war for possession of the hemisphere. Neither the Indians nor the whites were united, so that both alliances and battles took place across racial lines. Many Indians allied themselves with the newcomers in warfare against other Indians, for revenge against erstwhile Indian conquerors and oppressors, or to share in the spoils of war, or to gain other advantages. Similarly, the Europeans fought among themselves for a variety of reasons and had Indian allies against fellow Europeans. The British and French, for example, clashed repeatedly in battle in North America, as they did around the world, and both had Indian allies in these battles. In addition, there were simple European versus European battles, as there were Indian versus Indian battles. The Dutch sent a naval squadron to attack the British settlement in Virginia, and the British government under Cromwell sent expeditionary forces to colonial America to force the surrender of royalist governments in various British colonies on the North American continent and in the Caribbean. In South America, rival contingents of Spaniards fought among themselves over the spoils of the Incan Empire and, when much of this treasure was shipped off to Spain, British privateers waited on the high seas to intercept it. In short, colonial-era rivalries and alliances were not based on race, but on expediency. In 1701, a letter written by a British colonial official spoke of the Iroquois Indians to the West as the only barrier against the French forces, including the Indian allies of the French. As late as the first few decades of the newly created United States, major military battles between whites and Indians remained rare in this part of the hemisphere, certainly as compared to the hundreds of battles per decade that would later occur in the United States after the middle of the 19th century, when a now vastly larger white population sought far more land and had both the numbers and the military equipment to take it. Even during this later era, however, much of the land transfer from Indians to whites in the United States was through what might be called semi-conquest, as the American government paid millions of dollars to Indians for their land but only about half of what that land would bring in the market. Many of the conquests of the Western Hemisphere were not like the conquests of modern Europe, 
where one organized state attacks another militarily, and after defeating it on the battlefield, takes over its territory and its sovereignty over the people living there. Many of the early European conquests in the Western Hemisphere were a series of uncoordinated campaigns by fighting units operating under the general auspices of the governments of Spain or Portugal, but by no means always under the effective direction or control of rulers or officials on the other side of the Atlantic. Given the slowness of communications in the era of wind-driven ships, news of what was being done in the name of Spain or Portugal often reached the Iberian Peninsula long after it was a fait accompli. Even Spanish viceroys in the Western Hemisphere could lose control of the situation some distance away, as both Cortes in Mexico and Pizarro in Peru ignored the orders of their Spanish superiors in the New World. The British colonies in North America were likewise settled and expanded in piecemeal and often uncoordinated ways, typically by land purchase rather than military conquest in early colonial times. However, even in a given colony, such as Pennsylvania, the treaties made with the Indians by the Quaker leadership in Philadelphia were often ignored by the Scotch-Irish settlers on the western frontiers, who tended to settle on whatever land they found desirable, without worrying about whether it was inside or outside some line drawn on a map in Philadelphia. Given the Scotch-Irish tradition of occupying land they had not bought, whether in Britain, America, or Australia, this could hardly be surprising. Long after a growing population and an improving weapons technology put the Europeans clearly in the ascendancy throughout the hemisphere, there were still large frontier regions where Indians maintained their independence and their ability to fight. In 18th century Argentina, for example, Spanish frontier settlements were often subjected to Indian raids, during which captives would be taken away by the Indians, often to be either ransomed later or to be retained as slaves, including concubines, for the Indians preferred capturing women and killing men, while children would be raised as members of the tribe. It was very common for Indian tribes to have Spanish captives, nor were the numbers involved negligible. During a long Spanish military campaign against the Indians in Argentina, more than 600 captives were freed. Their average period of captivity was nearly nine years. Much more common was the practice of paying ransom to get back individual Spaniards who had been carried off. Some Spanish men also escaped but women were less likely to do so, and in fact, some women who were ransomed later returned to the Indian communities voluntarily, for their status in Spanish society was now degraded, since they were considered to have been dishonored by being concubines of Indians. The capture of whites and their retention among the Indians was not a phenomenon limited to Argentina by any means. A mid-eighteenth century report on the aftermath of Indian raids on European frontier settlements in western Pennsylvania stated, the Indian villages are full of prisoners of every age and sex. White women captured by the Iroquois likewise often chose to remain with them, because the white settler society from which they came also considered them ruined. The importance of the discovery of the Western Hemisphere by Europeans continued to be enormous, long after the age of discovery itself. In addition to the new foods, medicinal herbs, and tobacco received from the Americas, Europe developed a massive trade with the colonies, and later independent nations, of the New World. Centuries-old patterns of trade in Europe were disrupted, and in some cases destroyed, by a shift in the directions of commerce. The relative importance of the Levant as a supply center for international trade from the Middle East and the Far East declined as the Americas replaced both international and internal European supply sources for a variety of products. Eventually, massive shipments of wheat from Argentina and the United States provided the daily bread of increasing numbers of Europeans and deprived many European wheat-growing peasants of their livelihoods. Sugar went from being a luxury of a few in Europe to being an item of mass consumption, supplied by the plantations of the Western Hemisphere. Cotton from the New World likewise reached the masses in Europe, making clothing more affordable than woolen garments had been. Nor was this a small contribution. In pre-industrial Europe, where ordinary people spent more than half their income for food, clothing was something purchased only a few times in a lifetime, markets in second-hand clothing flourished, and hospitals had to guard against having clothes stolen from corpses by people desperate for something to wear. In these circumstances, cotton from the New World was a major contribution to the European standard of living. 